The Oklahoma Sooners have changed offensive coordinators. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Shout out to all the everydayers out there. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase over at Game Time. He's Jay Smith. I'm John Williams. The Oklahoma Sooners have fired Seth Luttrell. They've promoted Kevin Johns and Joe John Finley. Retained as co-offensive coordinator, Joe uh, Kevin Johns will join him as co-offensive coordinator. Jay, what's your initial reaction to the news of Seth Luttrell's firing? I'm going to be honest. I thought we were going to be on here and be upset about kind of how things went down on Saturday. And now everybody's happy. Isn't that really weird? Like how all of this just completely changed? Look, I don't want to celebrate someone losing their job. That's never a good thing. But I will celebrate Brent Venables making a decision. Brent Venables decided that, you know what we have to do? We got to make a change. And unfortunately, Seth Luttrell was dealt a pretty bad hand. You know, he's dealt a pretty bad hand. The problem with it is that he played that hand just as bad as it was dealt to him. There was some things that needed, we all saw that needed to happen and it didn't. And so now that we've made this adjustment, we've elevated Kevin Johns, which me and you have talked about on here, John, we talked about Kevin Johns as the QB coach because he's an offensive analyst. So he's been working with quarterbacks, probably not as much influence as he's going to have now. But him and Joe John Finley, who currently knows today's playbook, is probably why you kept Joe John Finley in there. And I thought it was fascinating, though, that Joe, that Kevin Johns is going to be a co-offensive coordinator. So it looks like we made a move that should truly benefit the team going forward. But how'd you feel when, you know, when I shot you that message that this went down? Not surprised, but also a little bit surprised. I didn't think I that Brent Venables would have it in him to pull the trigger. You know, we talk about mm. the offensive situation, you know, Seth Luttrell being dealt a bad hand, the quarterbacks not really being able to let their talent shine at times because lack of wide receivers, because of the injuries, the shuffling off of the offensive line. So I'll, Today on Sunday afternoon, you know, as I'm, you know, starting to reassess where I, how I feel about this team and the, and the game on, against South Carolina, starting to wonder like, okay, maybe they'll give the offensive coordinator situation the benefit of the doubt, knowing that they're, like you said, playing with a bad hand. I mean, they got two seven in Texas Hold'em and they're deciding to play it out to the river and see what happens. Well, that's not the best way to go about things. So listen, I think Seth Luttrell is better than what they showed this year, better than what the team showed this year. At the same time, it's similar to your quarterback situation, right? With Jackson Arnold, with Michael Hawkins, it wasn't producing. And honestly, at times like, like Saturday with Michael Hawkins, like the Tennessee game with Jackson Arnold, when it's kind of falling apart and it's not productive, you kind of have to do something to try to, create a spark yeah and i think that's probably what this is about is kind of getting a head start a little bit on one evaluating joe john finley as a play caller he's he's very well thought of in that facility that's why they retained him and and tried to keep him from going to mississippi state with jeff levy even in the industry he is yeah yeah so you get a head start now on okay can joe john be an offensive play caller can he be the guy that creates the game plan and executes it on game day. We'll find out. And then I think for Brent Venables, it kind of gives him a little bit more. What's the right word for this? Positive PR with the fan base, maybe because, yeah. you know, yeah. similar situations happen under Lincoln Riley. And I mean, he was willing to make a, make a defensive coordinator move. Right. And we found out that Brent Venables is willing to make the offensive coordinator move to try to establish himself as kind of a, a long-term head coach here. If you yeah. don't, if you don't change things and if you don't improve the offense, you're not going to be here long-term. And so you had to make a move. Unfortunately, Seth Luttrell is the guy that kind of has to fall under the ax a little bit for this situation. 
And I see why you said that it's kind of a surprise that Brent Venables made this move. And and I, I agree that... Because he's an Oklahoma guy. Yeah, and, you know, former team captain, national champion. He, he, he bleeds Oklahoma in every capacity, and unfortunately it didn't work out. But as you stated, though, Brent Venables has now made two critical decisions that will now give him one. He has one more left that I think will be the defining moment of him as a coach. His first one was when he decided to let go of Ted Roof. Yep. That That's was huge. probably the largest decision he had to. Ted Roof has been a protege of his for years. He brought him with him from Clemson and someone he trusted with his playbook. It didn't work out really the first three years. And so he decided to let Ted go and when he let Ted go, he brought in this young, spry, former protege of his at Clemson, Zach Allen, which all of us just say he's a clone. He basically went to the machine, cloned himself, and brought his own, a, new, a younger version of himself here. But that was a massive risk to take. Mm -hmm. Huge. The question was, can he, because truth be told, Brent Venables was hired to bring a defense to Oklahoma, something we haven't had. Each year we've seen improvement but not enough where well, you bring Zach Alley in and guess what you see massive improvement. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that that defense is overshadowed by terrible offense. Yep. So his first movement was Ted roof. Then he hired Zach Alley third one so far. So my apologies going on his fourth third one was seeing that the offense is going so bad that you went ahead and fired a coach mid season. And Venables mentioned this, even in his presser, this is not something that he's accustomed to when he was at every stop he's been at most changes happen at the end of the season. It really wasn't any firings during the year. Hence why Ted roof was let go at the end of the season and not in mid season form. Well, now he had to make a mid season change. This is, this is big. Now the most critical part of his job as head coach and his tenure as head coach of Oklahoma Sooners is going to be who he hires at offensive coordinator. So he's got two coordinators he had to hire. He's hired his defensive guy, and <clears throat> truth be told, he's blessed because defensive guys don't leave very often. Those guys stick around six, seven, eight, nine years, 10 years underneath one coach before they take another job because people don't like hiring defensive coaches, even though Kirby Smart and Nick Saban were defensive coaches and won national championships. Dan Lanning. Dan Lanning's another one. I digress. <laughs> 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 that's not common but offensive coaches they're gone every two to three years i went back mm -hmm. and looked at nick saban's time at at alabama you know how many offensive coordinators he had a billion he had eight of them in his in his what it was like 15, 16 16, 16 years. years yeah he had about eight different ones and only coach that lasted longer than two years was lane kiffin he lasted three sark was an analyst but he was only the offensive coordinator for two years so this is a common thing. You're going to see OCs leave mm -hmm. all the time, yep. but you don't see defensive guys. So for Venables, it's now time to prepare ourselves. Levy was gone. You now need to bring a successor and be prepared for them to be gone in two years and then move on to the next one. Yeah, I think this move is interesting, especially given the fact that Jeff Levy's offense at Mississippi State is actually somewhat productive, and they've got a true freshman quarterback in Michael Van Buren that is leading the way for that productive mm -hmm. offense. Again, they, they were able to score some on Texas. Uh, they were able to score some this week against Texas A&M. So you, you look at that and you think, okay, there's some kind of disconnect. Are we not as talented as Mississippi state? And if that's the, if that's the case, if you're not as talented as Mississippi state, the problems are bigger than what you might imagine. But if you think you are, then there's something, again, we've talked about it, the disconnect between what the play caller and the offensive coordinators are expecting and the execution on the field. Can Oklahoma's offense actually get better amidst the change? We'll discuss that coming up next here on Locked On Sooners. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol pro probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Pre-alcohol pro produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember, take Z-Biotics before 
your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Here's how to use it. Step one, drink pre-alcohol. For best results, make pre-alcohol your first drink of the night. Step two, drink responsibly. Pace yourself, hydrate, and get a good night's sleep. Step three, enjoy tomorrow. Wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. Go to zbiotics.com forward slash locked on college. You see the link here in the description below to learn more about, learn more and get 15% off your first order when you use locked on college at checkout. ZBiotix is back with 100% money back guarantees. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, head to zbiotics.com slash locked on college and use the code locked on cost at checkout for 15% off. So the Oklahoma Sooners have made the offensive coordinator change. Now we're trying to figure out, can they actually get better? I thought it was interesting that Joe John Finley moved up into the booth on Saturday against South Carolina, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of a writing on the wall situation with the offensive coordinator situation. I thought the offense did some positive things. It wasn't good enough and it wasn't to the standard that Oklahoma expects on the offensive side of the ball. But given the defensive front that they were playing against and that defensive front for 54 minutes of game time could simply pin their ears back and get after the passer. I thought the offense did some solid things and maybe there's an indication there that, Hey, Joe John Finley was a bigger part of the play calling situation on Saturday. The question is, is will he simplify the offense? Cause it's going to be a combination. So, Based upon the, the press release, it sounds like Joe John Finley will be the play caller. But I think Kevin Johns is going to have a little bit more influence, and he probably will actually take in some of his input. Now, I know Sooner fans are not going to be happy of the fact that Joe John Finley is still here for whatever you know their personal reasons are behind that. But it sounds like he brings not only continuity, but a good understanding of the playbook. Because the one thing you have to remember, no matter what, the Oklahoma Sooners cannot change the entire playbook seven games into the season. Nope. We've got Ole Miss coming this week, and I promise you, Ole Miss is coming with a vengeance. They've been losing games that they shouldn't, and this is one of those games that if they lose, ooh, buddy, Lane Kiffin might actually be looking at that Florida job <laughs> because that is not a good thing for them. So the Sooners are right now a dog, and a heavy dog in that game, and we'll talk about it later this week. But honestly, the one thing that – Joe John Finley, as well as Kevin Johns, was going to need to do is truly just simplify the offense, as well as scheme it to where the offensive line, as much as it struggles, can actually excel. Don't put them in situations where they're running plays that they don't know or understand. Don't put them in situations where they have to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one blocking. Move the pocket. I, I think you're right. There, the, the good things I saw was I love when they had the pocket moving and they had the quarterback rotating out. You saw that with Hawkins. You saw that with Jackson Arnold, I'm like, okay, moving the pocket, that's a good thing because we know that there's struggles there. The young line is still too young. We need to get them stronger. We need to get them more experienced. And to be honest, if you're moving a quarterback who's mobile, makes sense. Also, can we not run QB power like ever again? Can we just delete that? Add that to the RPO and um, whatever else I, I said to get file. rid of. The inside yeah. zone, get yeah. rid of that. Outside zone was working. Tosses were working. If we can get a decent run game going, the play action will be there too. And we had a decent run game going on Saturday. Yeah, Barnes rushed for 70 yards. He averaged 4.1 yards per carry. Like it was his best game. Like, and that kind of got lost in the sauce a little bit because Oklahoma had to throw so much to just try and find a way to work back into the game, which they never could. But the run game was actually doing things. It was. It took it took till their fourth offensive series for them to actually run the ball in their first run call. Javante Barnes picks up seven yards. Yep. And so you're like, and listen, my dude, Javante Barnes, we're not going to confuse him for Adrian Peterson. We're not going to do that. But my, my guy played his heart out in that he game. He runs hard. And when they just ran simple run plays and it wasn't attached to a read option, it wasn't attached to an RPO. It was effective. So, I I want to I want to sit here and think and believe and and maybe this is again John's optimism getting carried away that John, that's a little bit of Joe it. John influence and and listen Joe John Finley he's going to be more in the Jeff Levy school of offensive style I think 
because they were together. They've been together at different parts of their coaching tenures. So that was Lebby's best man. <laughs> yeah. And best there, friend. Yeah. And there was a big thought that he might follow Lebby to Mississippi State when Lebby took the head coaching job out there. Well, now he gets an opportunity to coordinate Oklahoma's offense. We'll see if he's able to do enough over their final five games when they play a good old Miss defense, a good Missouri, a solid Missouri defense. I'm not going to call them good. I don't know how good they are. I don't think they're actually very good, uh, but a good Alabama team and a good LSU team that those are yeah. going to be some really, really big tests. But if the offense starts to hum, you may have your answer at offensive coordinator going into 2025. We'll see, but you've got an opportunity if you can just play to what you can do well. And I think we found a few things that they do do well, that they can run the ball. They can yeah. be effective in the run game. That's a really good South Carolina defense. And again, they, they were probably just thinking rush the passer, rush the passer, rush the passer, but Oklahoma was able to run the ball against South Carolina a little bit. So lean more into that. But yeah. I, I think you have, you have to figure out if Joe John Finley can be the guy and now's the opportunity to find out. Yeah, we're going to find out everything we need to know basically at this point. You got, you got, what's this? You know, we've got what, five games? Five games. You got five games to go out there and show us what you're made of. And the good thing is, is usually whenever there is a change in coaching like that, you start to get like a re energized team. Yeah. Right now, we need to see this offense put their hustle in. You're right. Javante Barnes works hard. You can tell that he, he busts his butt. Um, I've seen Gavin Salchuk look like he's trying to bust through holes whenever he's trying to figure out where to go. The key thing is, can we simplify the offense? And even with that, when we talk about this, this, this new coaching search, we're going to have to do with offensive coordinator for Oklahoma. Brew Venables is going to, going to take some time to do this, but I would not be focused on that right now. I would focus on getting through this season, seeing if you can get yourself to a good bowl game. And then you can talk about that later, but there's no reason to basically sacrifice the last part of the season by focusing on the future. Any offensive coordinator that you all would want that's worth anything will not be available until probably January. Yeah. So you're going to keep your eyes open until playoffs are over because I mean, there's a good chance that the guy you want, it's going to either be at a nice bowl game or be in the playoffs. Good thing is, is, I'm assuming that the team is going to, in front office, is going to be like, you know what? Go get somebody good. We don't care. You were paying Seth pretty solid. We're going to pay whoever else we need to solid. Go find yourself the guy that you need. And then from there, evaluate every staff member. Make sure that, you know, you've got all the positions you want. Don't hold back. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but just take a look in the mirror with all of them. But I think that the offense will improve this week. I think we'll see a different type. I think we'll see a different bounce from these players. I think we'll see a different level of excitement. And that to me is probably way more important than anything else that we'll get. Yeah. How they respond this week is going to tell us a lot about what this team is made of. Yeah. You know, you've seen the defense play with resiliency. You saw them play with heart. Now you got to go see the offense do the same thing. You got to see the offense play with heart, play with resiliency, play with toughness and get out there and execute at a higher level. One of the, if there was any criticism of Jeff Levy's offense, sometimes maybe it was too simple and maybe that could be a benefit here that, Oh it, my gosh. I mean, and if again, Joe John Finley, a little bit of part of the quote unquote, Jeff Levy coaching tree, if that can be effective, then by, by all means run it. I know people are going to scoff at the idea of the jet sweeps. The jet sweeps had been effective with Dion Burks running them. Now we hadn't seen a whole lot of them, but that outside run play, whether it's a, a zone, an outside zone to Javante Barnes or jet sweep to Deion Burks, it had been an effective part of the offense. So don't shoot, don't shoot Joe John Finley the first time he runs a jet sweep to Deion Burks, because again, it was an effective part of the offense early in the season. We just haven't run it. It hasn't, I haven't seen anybody run a jet sweep or a wide receiver reverse since Deion Burks has been out. Have right. You? I mean, I don't think there's anybody else that you really want to run that with right now. Um, Maybe not. But in the future, I yeah. agree. I, I would like to see Ragens do that. I would like to see KJ Daniels get that. Uh, little dudes just, just run and outrun everybody. You know, I would love to see that. If anything, John, what I want to see is the this team simplify the offense. Go, go super simple. Go back to Levy's offense. Go real simple and just get rid of that ball as fast as possible. 
And I don't mind going with a little tempo if we're moving the ball effectively. Right. Doesn't hurt me. Yeah. Tempo works because it helps you find a rhythm, helps you keep the defense off balance. We've seen that work against Oklahoma's defense this year. But if you play with a little bit of tempo and you can play a little bit upbeat, then maybe you can take advantage of some matchups uh, on, on the outside in the passing game. So we go try everything. We don't care. Got you. Yeah. <laughs> Just throw everything out there and see what sticks and see what works. Uh, one thing that is working that Oklahoma Sooners defense. If you're looking for last minute tickets and the best prices, you got to go check out game time. Game time has a great feature called game time picks where they kind of break down the best deals available in your area for the best concerts, shows, sporting events, comedy shows. I mean, there's all kinds of options for you to go get entertained in your area. I'm looking right now, if you're looking to make the trips to Oxford, Mississippi, go get in the Grove, go see what that tailgating experience hmm. is like. There are a lot of tickets available over at game time right now. I'm seeing under 200 bucks in the lower level. Really? Fantastic prices right now. I, I see 137, $137 to sit I'm in jealous. the end zone uh, to go watch Oklahoma play Ole Miss. Now that might not be an enjoyable experience from a football standpoint, if you're an Oklahoma fan, but if you want to just wow. go be a part of the tailgating experience, down there in the Grove and go watch a game in an SEC stadium. Go check out Game Time. Download the Game Time app today. Create an account and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, Game Time takes all the guesswork out of buying tickets. Go download the Game Time app today and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Over at Game Time. Again, thanks for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Shout out to all the everydayers out there. Tune into the show wherever you get your podcast. We're free and available on all podcast platforms and part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, Jay, we've talked a lot about the offensive coordinator situation. We hadn't really spent a whole lot of time talking about the game. I spent 50 minutes talking about the game on Saturday. You're joining us now to, to kind of give us your reaction to what the Oklahoma defense did on Saturday because that was a bright spot. If, there, if you could find any kind of bright spot in that game, it was Oklahoma's defense. John, we gave up 259 yards, a total 259. offense. When's the last time you heard us do that in, in a conference game? Yeah. In a, I, it's got to <laughs> be see like what I'm saying? mid to early 2000s or something like that. Even as bad as some teams that we played against and we've destroyed, we still never held teams under 300 yards like this. Like We didn't hold them this low, mm -hmm. and that was what was impressive about it. South Carolina has been putting up yards on people. They're, they were averaging almost over 400. And the run game is really one of their stronger suits. Yeah. Rocket Sanders had like 30 something yards rushing in this game. John, like, if I would have told you that, you would have looked at me and be like, no way. There's no way the same Rocket Sanders who against LSU rushed for like 100 and like 30, 40 yards. Let me get this real quick. There's no way this Oklahoma defense held him under. 50 yards. John, we held him to 15 carries for 33 yards. They were trying to run the ball on this, this entire game, mm -hmm. and they found no success, averaging 1.9 yards per carry. John, I'm going to even do them a favor. I'll take Davis Bevel's one carry for negative 13 yards, which I guess that was the kneel. That's a long... That's I think that was a, a P.J. Adebawari sack. Oh, yeah, that was that sack. He did sack him, and they, they gave us credit for that. Take that off of there. They had 89 rushing yards all game long, and that is not what South Carolina does throughout the year. South Carolina is a lot better with that, and we did a good job of stopping it. The one thing that we did well, the one thing we struggled against Texas with, but we didn't struggle with nobody else. We didn't even struggle with this with Tennessee, but we made sure that South Carolina couldn't do it. The, 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 the problem is, is that this defense is doing all this work, and it's being undone. It was being undone by the offense, and now with the changes on the offense – there's a possibility that we see an even bigger improvement on the defense. Yeah, even if you take away the sack yardage from what South Carolina was able to do, I mean, yeah, they still ran for, according to Pro Football Focus, 122 yards on 35 carries. That's 3.5 yards per carry. So if you take all the sack yardage out, that's still yep. pretty good. I mean, again, you still held Raheem Sanders to 2.2 yards per carry. That, that, that's really, that's really crazy. Good. And again, this is this is an Oklahoma defense that didn't let up. You got down 21-0 in the first 
five minutes and like 40 seconds of the game. And at that point, it would have been really, really easy to fold up shop and decide, all right, we're done. But they played. They played hard the entire game. The and entire they played time. a lot of people for the entire game. You saw a lot of guys get snaps. Yeah. And it it maintained a good level of in- intensity. I mentioned it on the live show on Saturday that they gave up one drive, one scoring drive where South Carolina started with the ball in their end of the field. Yep. That's Otherwise, how they scored they the touchdown and got the two point conversion. Yeah. That was it. They they gave up a field goal on a short field, a touchdown on a short field, and then two touchdown, two defensive touchdowns. And that, I mean, that was it. So like, and then, and then there was the fake, you know, after the fake punt failure, South Carolina gained four yards and then kicked a field goal. Yeah. Like your defense stood tall. So as much as, you know, you want to talk about even South Carolina got conservative, but they did not get conservative until really late in this game. Shane Beamer was on a mission to try and put points on the board against Oklahoma. He really wanted to, to, to chalk up those, uh, those, those bonus points. Those. Yeah. He needed style points. Yeah, yeah. He wanted them style points. I mean, this is a team that like, honestly, if there's a three win team that could make the playoff South Carolina. Could, yeah. Three loss one. Yeah. That, I mean, their schedule point is... loss to Bama, a three point loss to LSU and a dominant the, win over Oklahoma and Norman. Like, they're I'm not saying they could. I'm just saying if right. they ran the table. I don't know. And why they've not. got they've got three they got three straight ranked games: A and M, Vanderbilt, Missouri. Then Wolford's their typical SEC FCS mm-hmm. game, and then they got they travel to Clemson, who's number nine. And, and so back to our defense, man. The defense I, the defense played great. I thought they played really, really well. I had people trying to downplay it and say they played good. They played fine, blah, blah, blah. No, they played really good. They had 22 total pressures. They had six sacks. They had double-digit tackles for lost. You know, they they made Lenora Sanders work for his yards. And yeah. he, he, he gained some rushing yards. You know, again, take the sack yardage out. He had 60-something rushing yards. But he did not necessarily look very comfortable as a passer. And that's a credit to Oklahoma's defensive line that had him under pressure for a lot of the game. Yeah, all intents and purposes, man. This defense did everything you asked for. Yeah. They gave up 180 yards pass, and they gave up 76, what counts, right? The net yards is 76 yards rushing. They did everything that you could ask them and more. They, I mean, they, they, they unfortunately was not able to get a bunch of turnovers in this game because South Carolina didn't have to do a lot. They tried to force some fumbles. Like, I mean, if you go back and watch some of the way the defense of uh, these linemen were hitting Lenore Sellers on their sacks, I thought we were going to get lucky enough to get one swat down, but we didn't. But, man, they were in – I mean, the David Stone almost sack was probably my favorite one of the game because it showed the hustle. Stone came in there like a bat out of hell, and he flew right over the top. And Sellers, being the athlete he is, he was able to duck around it. And as soon as he ducked and tripped up, Holton was still on his tail. Boom, took him down. That's what you need. You want guys that's going to continue to hustle even if you're struggling. They did that. Nonstop the entire game. Yeah, you you can't even you cannot be mad at that type of performance from this team. And I'm just hoping that the defense can keep this intensity going forward, especially at Oxford, and then from there going into the they went to the bye week into Missouri, and then prepare and play Maine because Maine's gonna be a challenge. They're throwing deep passes out there. Then you got Bama LSU. I just need them to show up against Ole Miss. I just want that game to be close. If there's anything I've asked for in any of these games, I just want them to be fights. The last two have not been. They haven't been close. Tennessee, honestly, wasn't as close as I wanted it to be, but it's fine. But if you give me that going forward, we beat Auburn. If you keep give me that going forward, I won't complain. Yeah. If, if the offense can show any sense of life and the defense continues to get this kind of performance – you have a chance to at least surprise people with the, with the effort. I'm not going to sit here and say they go into Oxford and beat Ole Miss. That's not going to, I don't think that's going to happen. Agreed. At the same time, I think you can, you can prove the doubters wrong. You can get out there and you can, you can show that, Hey, we're not going to go down without a fight. Uh, but a, a lot, it's going to take the offensive you know effort to back that a little bit, but the defense, again, playing with pride, playing with heart, fighting for the for the team. They did everything they could to keep Oklahoma in the game. 
now it's up going to be up to the offense to carry their share of the load. Defense can't do it all. And likely they're not going to get very many opportunities to create turnovers because teams will be able to play conservative football against them, knowing that the offense has struggled, uh, especially in SEC play. The offense, they've only averaged 11.75 points per game in the SEC in conference Oof. play. Oof. Not good enough. So got to get some offense. Hopefully Joe John Finley and Kevin Johns have some answers as to how to do that. We'll continue to break that down. See, Hey, what can we expect from Oklahoma's offense moving forward? We'll talk some offensive coordinator possibilities for the future as well at some point on this show, but uh, that's going to do it for today's episode of locked on Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning in, being a part of the show, subscribe to the show, wherever you get your podcasts, we're free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop, follow Jay at unfair sports, go check out his channel unfair sports as well. Follow me at John nine Williams. The show is at locked on Sooners on all the social media platforms, but until next time he's Jay, I'm John Boomer Sooner. <laughs>